Hello everybody. Today I want to respond to an invitation by my favorite headhunter from Canada, Michael Jagdeo. So I send all my greetings to all in Canada also to all in the United States and nearby places like Hawaii and Alaska and of course Puerto Rico and Mexico and, and uh, that was my birthplace so inspired also by Mexico Central America, South America, Spain, and uh, the rest of the world. The title proposed by Mike of my presentation is called uh, Ancient Wisdom in Golden Letters, Gold, and the Fifth Industrial Revolution. It's an industrial revolution based on the rescue of the most ancient knowledge worldwide to propose, promote, and enable new technologies. In Mexico, we are having the fifth transformation so why not to have uh, in industry in technology the fifth industrial revolution my name is Fernando Castro Chavez so here is the table of contents and as we progress these uh, contents are going to be moving forward so let's start let's start with the introduction I am Fernando born in Guadalajara Mexico educated to serve my bachelor in sciences in science was in agricultural engineering my specialty then in the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara that is the Autonomous University of Guadalajara a private school, independent private school sponsored initially by the Rockefeller there I did my BSc in Agricultural Engineering with orientation of agroecosystems, which also included the rational, the reasonable exploitation of nature. And the specialty was animal science. My master's degree was biotechnology in the Universidad de Guadalajara. This universidad has uh, a lot of different branches in different towns of Jalisco, the state of which Guadalajara is the capital in Mexico. And that's the state university, a great university that really has more, way far more postdoctoral and doctoral and uh, advanced degree opportunities than any other in the state. So there I did my master's degree in biotechnology, doing there my research, my thesis, and even working in the CIATEG with a grant sponsored by the Council of Sciences of Mexico, CONACIT, so called then, and uh, I have my PhD, my doctoral degree philosophy doctor in molecular biology also by the University of Guadalajara this in the medical 
Sciences Center. The other was in the engineering uh, centers of the same university. Then I did a postdoctoral in Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. I'll talk of that later on. I arrived to the USA with a letter of recommendation from my PhD director that at that time he was uh, working at the Hospital Civil de Belén, the civilian public hospital of Bethlehem, that was the name. And my director's name, whom I am so thankful for giving me the break to go to the United States with his full recommendation, his name is Arturo Panduro Cerda. And I also send my greetings from here. And he sent the recommendation letter to an established researcher in the Baylor College of Medicine at Houston, Texas. And that man that received me was uh, from Hong Kong, a chair and director and professor of Baylor, now retired, called... Uh, Lawrence Larry C.B. Chan Larry Chan Lawrence Chan Constantine Chan So they Panduro and Chan were companions in advanced studies in the United States and that's how they met Since then I realized that it's not so much how much you know of knowledge theoretically but who you know and of course if you have a lot of theoretical knowledge sooner or later but more later than sooner somebody gets interested in your research as it happened with my great acquaintance from Canada Jack Deo hello again so in Mexico before going to Houston to the Texas Medical Centers I was researching the genes that produce the enzymes processing alcohol. We even published a chapter for a book in McGraw Hill related to this research. ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase, ALDH, aldehyde dehydrogenase, and CYP450, a cytochrome also specialized in processing the alcohols, the methanols, in the liver. Finding that the genes of the native tribes from Mexico are a perfect match of the Asian genes from China, both nations vulnerable to the alcohol. So they used to have uh, smaller amounts of alcohol to get drunk and with headache because the deficient degradation of methanol compared with the European nations that have the advanced cultures of the drinks from whiskeys, vodkas, beers, etc. So, but it is very interesting that the genes related with the pre-Hispanic uh, nations of Mexico that we were taking the DNA from the natives, the Indians, the pre-Hispanic tribes in the civilian hospital of Bethlehem are a match for the Asian uh, genes for these enzymes that are deficient in their processing of alcohol. Once in the USA, I did research against obesity, deleting the gene that produces the fast, the fat, sorry about that, the fat storage protein the fat storage protein structure or a structural protein called perilipin peri around or surrounder of lipin lipids fats that protein is the one that produces the cage that stores fat and when a researcher from Spain that was before me did the actual destruction of the gene I asked, even since I was in Mexico, if I 
could do microarrays of those animals. And Dr. Chang got very uh, allowing me, very happy that I was willing. And he invited me with an invitation letter. And that's how I got into the United States. Being paid the first six months from a grant also from CONACIT, the Science Council of Mexico. And the rest, I was paid by, by the internal grants that uh, Dr. Chan found with private companies, private foundations as well, uh, private uh, uh, altruistic foundations, I must say, most of them, not industries, uh, altruistic foundations. And uh, I was able to realize that with that alteration, the deletion of the gene that produces the fat storage unit, perilipin, is like a brick that uh, many perilipin uh, molecules uh, found are the foundation, in that sense, of the storage unit in the mice. And with that alteration, the mice never got obese, no matter how much fat and carbohydrates they ate. And you can check my articles by putting my name, for example, in the PubMed, and you can read all about it. But it was very, very exciting, very interesting times when I did the RNA extraction, the RNA messenger from five tissues, the adipocytes, the liver, the muscle, the heart, the kidney. These uh, mice without a fat storage unit if they did not have food and if they were put at four degrees after eight hours they died but for example if they were having food they ate more than twice the normal animal but they kept their temperature the temperature so which means that God gave them a sensor in their brains that told them it 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 your heat and to keep and to stay yourself alive so there is also a god-given reason of the fat storage units as we call them in mexico the driving wheels uh, when they are not that big they have a reason when they don't go in an excess with a, a normal reasonable um, contents according to the weather of course like in a tropical environment, like in Mexico, is not so much of a need to have those storage units. Now my current research is preserved in the PubMed, as I was saying before. That's the link. You can copy it. I'm going to put uh, in the foot of this YouTube uh, video this uh, PDF for you to copy and paste or to hit on it, to click of the NIH, the PubMed of the NIH, the Biotechnology Institutes of the NIH, for everybody to read it in full, to read it in full due to the grant received from them. There are um, 15 articles, and that's my email, also if you want to contact me. Then, in my postdoctoral, after being a professor of molecular biology in the Guadalajara University because after the Mexican Science Council gives you a grant they expect you to apply it in Mexico to help uh, the next generations of Mexico so I was teaching for a year to the first generations of uh, medicine the first and the second, and the first uh, generation of biology as well, the first. And that was also an extraordinary time. But then I was invited again back to Baylor College of Medicine, this time to receive a postdoctoral by the NIH, once they were looking at my previous publications in the NIH, they got interested in my pursuing and especially in the Baylor College of Medicine. And again, it was a good acquaintance that I met while I was working in my previous project of the fat-resistant mouse. 
and this was called uh, a professor, also retired now, Joel David Morissette. I also sent my greetings from here to him. He invited me and I went and I did my presentation. I was questioned a lot about my presentation that I did it based on my previous research plus some new research that I was doing independently about compatible genetic variation. So then I researched atherosclerosis in tier D by feeding human cells with iron and putting a magnet on the top of the Petri dishes. So this was a novel research that was going on from Rice University and Glauco Sousa was producing the Nano 3D and I was one of the first users and look the beauty of the cell cultures that were developed at that time by the use of that technology. So the first time I was one of the first and earlier users in the Baylor Colors of Medicine of microarrays even before the facility was integrated and then in my postdoctoral I was one of the first the first user in Baylor College of Medicine of the new technology of the new technology of nano 3D and these spheres that you see here are balls of cells that are growing spherically because of the magnetic iron in them that was floating and uh, these were, were from vascular smooth muscle cells of humans and uh, we were feeding them with lysophosphatidylcholine because one researcher before of me Casey Bickers, also a student of uh, Morissette did the discovery that it was not the whole uh, LDL the culprit but only the tripulants that were on the membrane surface of the LDL, the ones that were causing atherosclerosis, that while they are on the surface are called phosphatidylcholine, but once they get trapped in the carotid arteries of the neck, they split that phosphatidylcholine and it became called lysophosphatidylcholine which produces, as the name says, produces lysis of the muscle cells of the neck precisely, of the artery, of the artery, of the carotid, in this case the carotid of the neck. So the cells think that they need to start producing a wall on membrane, but a solid wall, in order to prevent them from bursting apart because of the detergent that is the lysophosphatidylcholine is a product of lysis but at the same time it becomes a product that causes the lysis of the cells so when I put the lysophosphatidylcholine obtained by Sigma Aldrich from the yolk of the eggs and they sell it commercially the cells started to calcium tubes but to my great surprise these are little cells here starting to get together if you can see them let me expand them it's a fascinating research all the research that i have done by the grace of god is very fascinating to me these are some few cells gathered, uh, gathered together you can see them here four of them and as they progress and multiply they became not only few cells but a lot of cells a ball and when i put the lpc they gather together instead of being separated they are gregory and they somehow find a tropism that makes them to be together. That's very exciting to me. And they start secreting the calcium, not randomly, but organizedly. Secreting the calcium like in a team, uh, with a tropism of finding the secretion towards the other ball of cells, so that they all secrete the calcium in the same direction, like in a tube shape. shape in a tube shape made also of calcium. It's uh, very fascinating and it's like an open research that is still really exciting to continue but I keep my attention in this photo because I am realizing 
something that sometimes when you do the experiments you just want to publish and don't observe with all the detail, all the details that are seen in those photos and once you revisit them years later or months later or days later or you just ask God, God show me what I cannot see right now but right now I am seeing how really the independent uh, balls of cells, the clusters of cells, all of them try to bind uh, like a, a necklace, uh, like a chain. And these groups are coordinated. And the coordination that ties them is precisely the tubes of calcium that is coordinatedly secreted. So, oh my God, I am very excited. And well, you can read more about it and how we developed the first model of uh, this uh, atherosclerosis in vitro and uh, is very 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 exciting so but sorry about developing this time on this I just got excited so discovering that LPC was the real culprit of the calcification of the carotids as a defense mechanism of the cells when they get calcified as is their defense mechanism preventing them to burst apart by the detergent effect of the detached substance coming out of the surface of the LDL. LPC, that's a, that as I mentioned, means lyso or lysis, lysophosphatidyl choline. And these are more of those amazing figures when I put them in a petri dish and I squeeze them with a cover slip also of glass this is how they look and this is the protuberance of uh, calcium that is secreted independently by all the cells that uh, organize them themselves and each cell secreting its calcium all of them put the calcium in the same location to produce these hollow tubes that transport uh, the calcium inside and uh, once it's outside it gets uh, fixed and solidified and very excitingly ex exciting because it keeps on growing and that calcium that organic calcium produced by the human vascular smooth muscle cells responds to basically all the wavelengths which make me even to be excited to produce some art with those uh, uh, figures or shapes that were being made by the cells themselves then I decided to pursue my own line of independent research in the 3D structures to represent the perfection as a Christian believer that believe in God as the intelligent designer. The more I look at the microscope, the more beauty and perfection I also found. And the more attentively that I look at the geometrical details of the genetic code, I found it more and more and more endlessly exciting. 3D structures to represent the perfection of the standard, the standard or human genetic code. I was the first one, the very first one, without vanity, because I don't make commercials of my research. But I was the very first one years ago. You can see also in my name the reference, the uh, tetrahedral representation of the genetic code. And before the tetrahedron is folded, the tetrahedron tetrahedron before that structure is folded it's just a triangle and I was the very first one that designed or discovered the design of God of the symmetry of the genetic code so the triangle that I designed is a hundred percent symmetrical in its amino acids for the first time design of the representation of the genetic code that makes me and made me think about the genetic code as a center of a software, as an engine of a software. I started programming, but I saw that this will be taking a lot of time and that, that this will be even beyond of my time and my understanding. So I hope one day I could have a lab with very good, the best programmers to develop this idea to put these third-dimensional structures of the genetic code as the center of a software to read sequences 
and to identify the outliers that are the ones that can produce the hereditary diseases and at the same time while the reading is going on to see the beauty of the rotation of these structures I even in one of my late publications I can as you will see a, a, a produce I, I w was able to produce a spherical representation of the genetic code a sphere so that's fascinating but this is for me very exciting to have been the first one and with all humility without any publicity or commercials I published silently my own articles many times I financed and I finance my own publications when the need is to pay um, I try to find also the journals even if they are new that will able to public for free my research but this is the triangle 100% symmetrical of the genetic code for the first time discovered by me humbly humbly and uh, when you fold it what you what, what you get what you get is a tetrahedron with all the hydrophobic amino acids at the center of the tetrahedron and with all the hydrophilic at the extremes especially the starting point at the top like one that gets the lightnings um, when there is an electric rain when there is raining the one that gets at the lightnings at the top of the buildings that's the top of the tetrahedron and the three bases are the exiting points like earth like land and those are the three stop codons it's fascinating and then i decided to reason the logic of the uh, methionine methionine the amino acid met m methionine that is not only the starting point of all the proteins but also can be used as one of the inner uh, nucleotides and i was in the task of interpreting geometrically that fact to represent the methionine the methionine at the beginning and also at the inside of the proteins in the inside of the proteins and I was inspired by God I came out with the idea of two tetrahedrons uh, put together and fused together to build this structure that is called a stella octangula in that way you have the methionine that is the beginning point again like the lightning rod that receives the entrance but also the methionine that is uh, in the base at the center which is right here the one that is in the inside of the protein so just to represent a simple fact of uh, biology of a methionine that is the beginning of the proteins a methionine that is uh, also a amino acid that can be inside the protein it took me to find out the structure of a stella octangular which means basically a double representation of the genetic code or basically having two genetic codes one in one tetrahedron that is called uh, functional and the other in another tetrahedron that is called structural and you just put them together like make them one make, make it one imaginarily cross through the other until they get uh, crossed over making this this beautiful stella octangular and of course also the cubic representation but again sorry I got so just very excited so the significance this research will help first in the educational understanding of the mathematical perfection of the genetic code created designed and imagined first by God and that's why we can crack the code because when there is when there is a previous intelligence that's the only way that you as a later intelligence can crack the code uh, written by the previous intelligence which is able to adapt to the most diverse geometries endlessly geometries can represent the genetic code and each one of them with logic with meaning and with beauty with symmetry so this is the lightning rod of the entrance in this case for example the entrance if this is an mRNA inside the ribosomes inside the ribosome the entrance of the first tRNA with the first amino acid that is methionine and my representation of the other methionine that is represented 
the methionines that can be represented inside the protein itself is this other one. So the entry methionine is here, the inside methionine is here, and as you see, just because of the logic of this, I needed to have two generic codes, one representing the entry and the other representing the inner function of methionine. And one is, as I say, the functional, the other is the structural, but the both of them have a beautiful perennial beauty. Because, for example, the functional, all the hydrophobic amino acids are at the center, like hidden, like protected by all the surrounding triangles that are hydrophilic. And in the other, that is the structural, all the hydrophobic also are hiding at the bottom, so to speak. Most of them. I, I saw one also hiding in the center of one side. But you can figure out all the biological meaning according to the functions of each amino acid, like the angle, the turning point, the proline is here precisely in the angles, in the angles, in the angles of both representations, the functional and the structural. This is fascinating. I, I am just very slowly re representing and presenting this because I get very excited. So, but not only education is going to benefit with my representations, third dimensional representations of the genetic code, but bioinformatics will also, will also benefit because when comparing sequences, it will no more be an abstract and a cold process as is right now, but an actual visual or the rotational tracking of each codon through the geometries representing the genetic code. For me as an artist, I like beauty, I like poetry, I like to write a lot, everything from essays to novels to poetry. And I like to be also the beauty of art while doing my studies of the genes. Because as artworks of a creator, they also have beauty, symmetry, perfection. So in these figures that I have at the top, I did a representation of what I want my software that has the genetic code as the engine, as the center, will be doing. Running an mRNA as if this genetic code was the, within the ribosome itself and to be going a uh, nucleotide um, codon, sorry, codon, which is three nucleotides, each three nucleotide, which is each codon by codon from beginning to end of the protein going and traveling through each one of the boxes or cells that are the re representing that are representing that are corresponding to each of the codons that are advancing three by three by three by three nucleotides three at a time uh, binding binding each one an amino acid uh, being transported by the, by the tRNA in the ribosome but then these are the representations or the figures that are formed so is art being produced by the proteins that are formed, which is totally and amazingly fascinating. Because each uh, protein will have its own profile. This will, this will be art produced by nature, by the mRNA and the full sequence of it as it moves from codon to codon to a different cell each time. Uh, within my representation of the genetic code as the engine. For example, this was a representation of a Neanderthal gene and what produced is a face of a monster, which is really, really something fascinating to me. And uh, for some reason I put the goings from the uh, one table to another and I give the explanation for that in my article. But this, all of these are representation of different proteins. This is a beautiful protein that made the shape while it was being read cell by cell according to the codons that were passing by through the ribosome. It produced a beautiful, like a dope structure. And this produced like an art, a modern art structure. Uh, something very very interesting but more than anything is keeping 
my proposed software is keeping all these shapes inside its memory so whenever it is an hereditary disease is like the outlier that it will not match uh, these uh, shapes and at the moment it will stop the program for the doctor, the researcher to see what is the outlier like one in a hundred, like one in a thousand depending on of the frequency of the particular uh, aberrant mutation that normally mutations produce diseases never a mutation produces something better in the sense of random mutations when there is a change for adaptation that have hot spots under a good control that is for the better and that is an improvement that will help an organism to adapt to an environment but I like to distinguish between a profitable adaptation compared with a mutation that causes a disease that is totally a random thing that has not this uh, hotspot logic that is something like uh, overrides the quality control mechanism of your molecules and that's when the harmful mutation arrives so while keeping all of these shapes after thousands and thousands of readings it will be easier to detect the outlier and you will check also as we will talk uh, in this context of the pandemic that is going on right now how we can identify artificiality in a code that's very important to see if it was really natural or if it was made in a lab my software will help just by having these uh, uh, cumulative sequences and their shapes and when the shape doesn't match the nature, the normal one, the norm it will be an outlier even caused by a harmful mutation or by the hand of men reaching a stall red flag point when we are dealing with a hereditary disease that's the outlier like uh, all the normal sequences will be in a shape like this following a line the more extreme like the height if this was the genes for the in the left side for the height the tallest persons so to speak will be in one extreme so to speak I don't know what is being represented here but don't pay attention to the numbers that's just to put an example and the smallest persons for example the uh, ones in New, New Guinea or the pygmies will be here and the tallest from Caucasian European Nordic descent here but the average will be like the media most of the humans will fall in the average but if, if is there one right out there very very tall without continuity or very very small without continuity like the Floresiensis once in an island the adaptation gets very weird and the small animals got big and the big animals got small that's the example of Floresiensis and the miniature elephants and of big 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 uh, beards and things that normally are small in islands get big like I remember the dodo like a dove like uh, overgrown and some other examples but uh, yeah the, the outliers are points that are way far out of the bell of the Gaussian bell of Gauss like right one here the red point is an outlier or like right here the, this uh, extreme graphic compared if the average was the small one if one goes all the way to the top is an outlier and is anti-natural like the comparisons of some features that are not human in the Neanderthals are outliers and we can identify the artificiality of that design in those olden days and that will open a very new interesting intriguing field of research under this fifth industrial revolution that takes seriously the ancient texts of course first and foremost the ancient texts of the Bible but also many other of humanity as long as they make logic and as long as there is some rescuable detail that could be a match with what we have as the number one point of reference 
of scriptures that in my case are the scriptures of the Bible because they make sense, scientific sense. Like the Nephilim, the Giants, the Neanderthal, the Goliath, Og, all of them were outliers. And that's why they got extinct. Instead of being products of evolution, were products of devolution or involution or degeneration of mixtures, blendings of humans with apes. That's what I am concluding about those. That's why they got extinct, because most of them got a sterility as the mule uh, is sterile. So, again, I got so excited with this, so let's uh, move on. But the outliers are going to be detected according to what I project with my software, that I just did a representation by hand of what the software will be doing within a massive scale once having the rotational ability in the software and the genetic code as the engine to compare sequences not only of individual genes but of full genomes. So I got a better understanding of the genetic code by studying the I Ching preserved in China, having six possible sets of combinations and each cell consisting of three plus three lines equals six. That was in my basic representation like this, for example, three plus three um, makes uh, one of the starting points that in case, this case I represented it with uh, proline, proline. And the, in the other extreme is the broken lines, like full broken lines like this. And uh, let me see where is the other full broken line, like right here. And in this case the opposite extreme was the F, while the opposite extreme was the P. But this is just only one of the six possible representations because the cube has six faces uh, and if you have the the, the cart the Descartes uh, um, axis of x and y the Cartesian because of the cart Cartesian axis of the y vertical and the x horizontal you have the three main characteristics of the nucleotides with the possibility to be put in six different combinations or positions which matches exactly the six phases of a cube. So I got a better understanding of all of this genetic code by the I Ching. Jack Deo is asking me how, how you discover the I Ching and I may say that it just came naturally. I started uh, exploring the circular representation of the genetic code and then I jumped to a, um, a square, but not the ordinary square representation of a creek that I find it really only useful for reference, but very dry and cold, like an address book. Very non-exciting, not meaningful biologically. I found the circular representation of the genetic code exciting and meaningful because every 90 degrees you have all the hydrophobic amino acids and all the other groups of amino acids that are compatible and their numbers also are in balance in the spherical representation of the genetic code. So it's biologically meaningful the spherical, the, the circular, excuse me, first the circular representation of the genetic code is more meaningful in 2D, two dimensions, circular representation of the genetic code is more meaningful than the square representation envisioned by Francis Crick and uh, that was the beginning the, the circular for me and from there I was invited to publish uh, a quantum representation of a square a representation of the genetic code where the compatible um, codons could be able to exchange positions that's the reason of the quantum name because they can constantly be like vibrating, like alive, uh, flipping positions, all the codons that belong to a same amino acid. This is a very beautiful uh, mentality and way of thinking about the genetic code as something alive and also vibrating and compatible. So it was easy to jump from the square representation to the I Ching and to discover that, that the original meaning of the I Ching was the most ancient binary like in a computer binary system to represent the 64 codons.
of the genetic code. Having the 64 codons, a perfect complementary double helix, starting with the opposite diagonal extremes, meaning the upper left pairing with the lower right and from there cell to cell, which means that I started analyzing the itching from left to right like this, and then I made a continuous uh, like this, like this, and then a continuous like uh, this, and then a continuous like uh, this. Sorry about the slowness, but I'm, I want to explain for you to have it clear. And when I made a mistake, I retraced my words so, like this, then like this, and then like this, you saw, as the first strand. So you can take the upper left side and stretch it as a strand and the end of that strand is right here. And then you can do the same with the lower part and you see that this part of the strand in the lower right extreme is a match to the upper left extreme. And so each one of the cells with each one of the complementary cells at the bottom. So the lower strand, if you go like this, one, 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 ends here. So this cell is the end of the lower strand, and it's a 100% and perfect match. Check, check you that with this cell, which means that the broken uh, lines, that means the zeros in the itching, are 100% complementary with the continuous lines, horizontal lines. Uh, rows, lines, that represent the one, the continuous represent the one, the discontinuous represent the zero, so the ones and the zeros are a perfect match. For example, the first one is the six zeros, and it's a perfect match to the six ones that is in this extreme, and so on and so forth, cell by cell, as they encounter themselves. So this is so beautiful and so meaningful, even structurally, you can have the formation of the double helix by looking at the representation of the I Ching and complementing one strand with the other. That's fascinating. And I strive when I was studying in the EDX, the free Harvard class of programming, of uh, C++. I took it and I was able to develop these uh, uh, designs trying to represent more visually, that was the full purpose of my beginning into programming, to represent more visually in the easiest way as possible what I am speaking right now that many times goes way beyond the understanding of my students and I need to present to them something visual to tell them I'm talking about this. And sometimes I, I don't need to say anything just to show the video and they say, oh, yes. So a video saves me minutes hours of explanation so until reaching the center in the opposite directions to integrate the double helix and as I say which were the center in the opposite directions this one that is the match match to this one so figure out yourself but I have this uh, video that you can see also by yourself of how this gets uh, complementing each other complementary you will see it and the same, I did another video with individual uh, complementary uh, codons for you to see what I am talking about. Because all of this is original, all of this is new, and it came out of uh, just praying to God and asking God, how can I represent in a beautiful, meaningful way for my students, my love for my students, the viewer in general is my student, the onlooker, the curious, all of them are my students that when they see and they get captured by the beauty of this, they give the glory of God who is the one that designed it. But I get the blessing of having been the one that did the discovery of this. These are the matches that I am explaining. You can see why they are completely complementary, all of these ones. So, pairing them one by one in a perfect match. So the ancient didactics representing the DNA replication is done by the old gene, the continuous line right here, one in the I Ching binary, pairing to the new Yang, the broken line. So this broken line is pairing with this continuous line. So the old gene is pairing with the new Yang. 
and the new jing which is the broken lines going to the right is pairing with the old yang that is the continuous line going to the left so the yin and the yang is the one that uh, made me complement as a pairing of uh, amino acid sequence of nucleotide sequences of uh, dna when it's being replicated sequences so the old uh, dna sequences when they split are the old gene and the old yang and the new strands are the new yang and the new jing and this forms a perfect uh, different strand from the other that is this one that can now split and from one cell divide themselves and transform into two cells so I want you to read all my articles, they give all the details and to pray about it, to understand what, what I am saying because I, I know that this was ancient knowledge that is all about DNA that when the new Chinese that arrived to that those lands found the representations of the I Ching and all of, of these uh, arrows they quite didn't understood what they meant that were all science from the times before of the flood of Noah as uh, far as I understand and I will try to explain later why I understand these things like that based on the basic basic text for the fifth industrial revolution which is the the Bible I'm gonna explain why I see this in this way but you can see that the issue is so simple 100% simple compared with the actual writing of the actual contemporary Chinese that is the most complex and hard to learn language in the universe in the world because it's not letter by letter but syllable by syllable and that makes it very 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 complex and uh, not practical but you need to memorize a lot of things to be able to write in, in Chinese so the language is totally 100% different in its complexity to the simplicity seen in the itching and in this uh, representation of the DNA replication as is posed until this day by the Jing and the Yang. And then the new Jing again a zero pairing to the old Yang again a one making a one zero zero one. And how the cells can be also represented by groups of uh, the codons that then you can erase the cell division to make them to form the compatible groups of uh, codons the full squares that make and produce the same amino acid and the same with this other representation when I was talking about my software it can be even represented by codons by triplets of nucleotides those are the codons or by the actual um, letters of the amino acids that seems simpler and cleaner but you lose the detail of exactly which is the compatible codon so you may lose some details of the frequency of which codon that is compatible producing the same amino acid is most used according to the organisms but both of them are used according to the need of the researcher even the most ancient representations of the reputed inventors inventors of the I Ching, Fu, Shi, and Nua indicate that it is related to the genetic code and DNA. These are the most ancient representations and that's just the double helix which came out of the I Ching representation of the strands that get twisted. So all of that was the ancient knowledge even before of this age of the prehistory as, as, as we call the times of the flood ante the Lulun was an, an old uh, accurate word to represent that that was also carried on for the documents that were discovered maybe uh, carved carved in stone or somehow also the alternative names of the I Ching are all biologically meaningful biologically related to genes 
as it is also called the book of changes, that's biology, that's the variation for the adaptation, or the book of mutations, that does the variation for diseases. You have here the both names for the itching, the changes that produce a good adaptation and the mutations that produce a bad disease. Being both, both names to call the itching from the past genetic terminologies, biological terminologies. And that's not enough in the ancient world. Also you find in the ancient ancient world the 20 amino acids represented by the Mayan. The Mayan numbers were vigesimal including the zero, also evocative of amino acids. And this is the way for me to represent in another article that I published. India, Troy, South America, all of them indicate that the swastika was a symbol of fertility and of life. Here we are not even paying attention to the use of the swastika for eugenetics, for eugenics as Hitler in the German dark, darkest hours uh, was used. But also the eugenics of the swastika of Hitler had a biological meaning. The Aryans, as he used to call them. But uh, in the past, that was not a, a racist, uh, superior race terminology. But just a meaning of the biology of life. Because when I represent the symmetries of the genetic code, I was very surprised that I found a rotational uh, meaning and pattern that produced unexpectedly. I, I did not plan to find this as vastica. So the meaning of fertility related with genetics as it's found in the most ancient uh, uh, drawings or dolls made by uh, the ancients not only in uh, South America but all over the ancient world. You can see that it's put in the belly as representation precisely of the baby that is being uh, formed. You, you can see the amazing things of the swastika through the years and through the past. And uh, was a biological meaning but in a cheerful way of life, mostly put in the bellies of women. And this was another swastika for a very old uh, Indian stamp also celebrating life. So I found the swastika when reordering the perfection of the genetic code. And I put all the explanations of why I did it and the logic of how I did it, all coming with the logic of... Were you always good at math? It's one of the questions Mike, Jack Dio. And I will say, mathematics is and always in, and, and always has been a very hard topic for me, both to learn and to teach. However, by using multiple real examples for each equation and of the geometries uh, represented by the equations or involved, I have been able to have a better understanding. For example, he, here I just showed the precious balance of what I was talking before, the circular representation of the genetic code that it comes with a perfect complementary balance in the opposite positions. And in one of, of my articles, I gave, give the explanation of why is that so, and why is that also meaningful biologically. So your hydrophobic amino acids that fall every 90 degrees in this circular representation can be exchanged, and the proteins are still functional even if some are bigger in size or with different colors inside your body and ones uh, work faster than others, like the alcohol enzymes from the Caucasians are better working in degrading methanol than the same enzymes from the Asians. And that is because adaptation to what is the normal use and most frequent use. So the first breakthrough was uh, my first research published in the US United States of America, a team work on the microarrays 
of five mice tissues on anti-obesity at the BCM, Baylor College of Medicine, that I explained. And when I made the sense, using as many softwares, I was able to find at that time in 2001, 2002, 2003, 15,000 uh, fragments of genes represented in the AFI matrix microarrays were starting to make sense. And I found, for example, the genes for the fat degradation upregulated and the genes of the fat uh, buildup downregulated. For example, here I, I show some of the changes of the perilipin knockout mice that are all the genes that degrade fats that are uh, swimming, uh, flying, running, uh, floating on the blood uh, strain because they don't have a place to be stored. All the organism activates the genes to get rid of that fat. So we have the Krebs cycle, the beta oxidin, oxidation, the beta oxidation and the electron transport chain, also known as the respiratory chain, activated, which means that the mice that are lean in order to burn fat, they breathe faster than us. They need to put more oxygen inside themselves to get rid of the fat. And they... <laughs> They breathe uh, more than twice also than the normal mice because they need to get rid of that fat and they do it through beta oxidation, respiratory chain, Krebs cycle. Fascinating, fascinating. So that's one of the proposals also of control of weight. Do some sort of exercise that makes you <laughs> increase your uh, breathe rate to put more oxygen in your body so you can burn more fat. Isn't that fascinating? So simple, so beautiful, so straightforward. My first personal research published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, the best and most reputable journal of theoretical biology, was an analysis of the patterns of the circular genetic code representation, such as hydrophobic amino acids every 90 degrees, and all of them have in the center the uracil, so this is one of the logic aspects that I found, but I found other two logic aspects that I call them the rules of variation, of the compatible variation. Because before of my time, everybody was just finding harmful, harmful mutations to describe hereditary diseases. And I started to change the pattern of a mind. So if you want to be outstanding, even if you are not immediately recognized, like Mendel, he was recognized after his death. The same Van Gogh, the same the Vicette, the composer of uh, like Carmen. Um, if you want to leave something enduring above and beyond your money or your fame, you do something that you really love. And people is going to value it even if it takes time. So start out in biology was another of the questions of uh, Mike. And I say I liked biology since my childhood when I used to go to the fields near my house to collect butterflies and amphibians. Some of the friends that used to go with me, I remember, were Benjamin Duran Casillas, son of a doctor, and Antonio Ornelas, also, y Pablito, his brother, Pablo Ornelas, that now is a doctor, also son of a doctor. So it's funny that I used to hang out with sons of doctors since my childhood and we all, medicine doctors I mean, and we all used to go to collect these beautiful organisms, butterflies and amphibians to finally get to work with mice as my preceptors of the importance of genes and their functions. So the mice were teaching me a lot, a lot of things about genetics just by learning how they behaved according to their changes that they had. For example, this in the right side is the obi obi mice. This in the left side, the perilipin knockout mouse. In one of the photos of my previous researcher from Spain, that now is in Madrid, in the Ramon y Cajal Hospital, Javier Martinez Botas. 
So surround yourself with good people that really love what they do and they will inspire you to do the same and more. Biblical cosmogony in brief. That's one of the next points that describes is also also half of the full presentation because that gives the sense of the meaning of the fifth industrial revolution to use the ancient knowledge for modern and new and advanced technologies like the use of the I Ching discovered in China but that I argue that was pre-Chinese because of the simplicity compared with the syllables that make the writing language of the Chinese but that just by the logic of seeing the opposites between complexity and simplicity but uh, more than that, more, more than the I Ching I am taking the Bible as the center textbook for the fifth industrial revolution you know the number five in the Bible means grace and we are living in the age of grace so the fifth industrial revolution, the revolution of grace also influencing the way of thinking in science the ancient manuscripts of the Bible in Hebrew and in Greek contain the best sequential wisdom. Biblical chron chronology of human history, the three heavens, the first heavens and first earth in the time of the dinosaurs, as far as we understand, the second heavens and second earth, the ones that we are living now, after God put a reordering in the universe in the first six days of the second heavens and second earth. So the six days of creation, as we study the Bible carefully in the Hebrew, are the six days of the reordering on, of something that had been previously created, but that had fallen into ruins for some, something universal catastrophic that happened at that time. And the third heavens and third earth are future when Jesus Christ is coming when Jesus Christ is coming with his father at the very end to establish the everlasting kingdom so even the millennial kingdom are part of the second heavens and second earth restored but the third heaven is gonna be a totally new um, baby on the block so to speak a new heavens and new earth totally renewed, transformed, beyond what I can explain, creation. It was in the beginning when the dinosaurs originated with no humans yet into existence. And these are the texts of the Bible where the dinosaurs fit, which is only Genesis 1.1. And uh, I like to read it. In the beginning created God the heavens and the earth and because he did it is my note he did it perfectly so that was a perfect initial creation without oceans yet because all the water was uh, sweet waters uh, drinking water mm -hmm. that was also the time of the Pangaea where all the continents were just one block of land the explanation how they have found the same animal and vegetable fossils distributed evenly through the whole Pangaea as if it were a block united in the beginning. Extinction of dinosaurs? It was right next that the dinosaurs all got extinct in Genesis 1-2. It says basically that and the earth became without form and void. So the earth was not originally without form and void because as we read in Genesis 1.1 it had been perfectly perfect created but then we understand by other scriptures that the evil Lucifer, the adversary, Satan, the devil rebelled against God because he wanted to own it all he had been participating when he was still in good terms with God in the design of the dinosaurs that's why he's called the great dinosaur, the great dinosaur, the great dragon in the book of Revelation. That we understand by the symmetries and structures discovered by Bullinger that uh, the Revelation book matches Genesis. And details that happen in one complement the understanding of the other, the other of the other. 
So if Revelation says that there will be no more ocean, salty ocean, in the new heavens and new earth, the third one, that means that originally it was no ocean, but the ocean entered precisely in the times of the the salty waters, I mean the saltiness, entered through the wet meteorites, the frozen meteorites that came from the outer space. All of this is fascinating and it's endless to explain that. But I just want to say that the earth was not without form and void in the beginning, but it became like that. And that's why God in the six days need to put a reordering of all of that. And scientists have found the evidence of the bombardment of meteorites filled with gigantic amounts of water, of salty water, that came out from the space. And God needed to reorganize those waters. And that was the beginning of the oceans. But also redistribute the waters of the whole universe. And that was the reason and the beginning of the great expansion. So imagine the full solar system filled with water in the time of the extinction, extinction of dinosaurs. So the sun went off, the planets stopped moving, all of it was frozen until God in the six days decided to put order on that. Reordering. The next six days were those to reorder the universe. And they have a beautiful sequence that shows that is the reordering of something that was pre-existing. That's why also it was so fast. And said God, let there be light. Remember that the Hebrew, you read it from right to left. And the tools like Bible Hub that is interlineal, one line with the pronunciation of the Hebrew and the other line uh, with uh, the English translation, is very good to understand the original texts little by little and to start making sense of the meaning of the consonants of the Hebrew. So, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. But this light was totally different than the light of the sun and the stars. It's another, another beast, so to speak, the light of the first day. And it's the light that started melting also all the frozen universe, uh, paradise. Man originated in the Middle East, place of paradise, and from there moved to North Africa and then to Europe. This contradicts the paradigm of out of Africa, but you can see that we better believe the scriptures of the Bible are as more trustworthy than the speculations of men. And we can see that in the Middle East, in one place called Hayonim, we find the most ancient fragments of men, almost as ancient as the ones found in Jebel in Hood in Africa. And it's just time to keep on digging around this Hayonim and they will find even older uh, human remains from the time of Adam and his um, uh, sons and the first generations of human and from there how they got redistributed and how humans were ancient and more older than Neanderthals themselves. In this particular uh, drawing from science of 2010, the Neanderthal uh, areas are represented in squares, in squares, and the human areas are represented in circles. The most ancient in dark, like this one, and like this one in Hyonim and the ones that are more recent in pale yellow. So you can go directly to the source and investigate yourself. But this is a fascinating uh, explanation that also shows what is the meaning of the old Neanderthal and the modern Neanderthal. And the old Neanderthal that were highly calcified match the humans of that time that were the Cro-Magnon. Highly calcified. Why? Because they used to live 800 years, 900 years. And the calcification continued. So that was the longevity before of the flood. So the discoveries of the science, when they are look, looked with the lens of what the Bible says as a truthful and honest report of the past, everything makes sense. Cro-Magnon and ancient Neanderthal in the longevity times before of the flood. That's why they got calcified. Imagine a human like Methuselah living almost a thousand years. And how many things a man can do if, it's, if, if he is focused in one field in all of those years. 
That's why I understand that genetics was discovered even in the pre-flood times. And before going to the to the next topic, I want to emphasize that because, uh, for example, in the times of the Ark of Noah, the big mammoths, the gigantic sloths, the gigantic rhinoceros, the mastodons, all of those gigantic mammals did not enter into the Ark because God sent to Noah the animals that were the original designs that were created by him. So all the ones that did not enter, those gigantic mammals, were already engineered by humans. Because remember that the Bible says, all flesh has corrupted its ways. Fascinating, fascinating way to see advanced technology in the pre-flood times. And how many of these surprises are still buried because of the flood in the depths of the oceans and in the depths of different regions of the land. Even the design of paradise is kept in the tabernacle and temple. So the tabernacle and temple are representations of the design of paradise, which at the same time are representations of the design of the dwelling place of God in heaven. And heaven is basically the cubic uh, place where God lives in the surface, beyond this universe, beyond the waters that surround the universe, because the universe is circumscribed, as Einstein demonstrated in his formulas, is confined and is surrounded by waters, and God is beyond that waters in the direction of the north polar star. That is the one like the finger pointing uh, direction to the address of God, the polar star, Polaris in the north. So, many things to say about that, many details to give why this was the representation of the Garden of Eden. The Holy of Holies as the garden midst with the two groups, the, the, two, the two trees, I mean, the tree of life in one place in this uh, center of the garden or the top of the mountain of the garden, I suppose I, I need to check that. And the tree of good and evil, that was another tree. So those two trees were in the garden midst in the Holy of Holies. Then the garden itself was the holy place where then the priests gather but the holy priest is only allowed or was only allowed to enter into the holy of holies once a year and then the external parts of the temple that are representation of the land of eden while the garden was the holy place and the holy of holies the garden midst the center of the garden and outside of the temple was the land of north east of Eden, the place where Cain was uh, expelled, and a lot of things uh, need to be said there, but I just give you the reference, check the research of Ernest L. Martin about all of these things, the temple and the tabernacle as a representation of the design of the Garden of Eden, and how they represented angels with big wings in the curtains of the temple and even also in the top cover, golden cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Then was the origin of the signs in heaven, the constellations that are the prophetic narrative of the plan of salvation of God. So each constellation, ancient constellation in the past, which were 4 times 12, 48, are talking about the history of salvation. Virgo, giving birth to Jesus, baby Jesus was represented in what is called now Libra, and the dragon with seven heads, the red dragon was represented by what is called now uh, Scorpio, because it's the only one that had a red star that goes bigger and smaller like a beating heart, Antares from all the 12 constellations and a part of the 12 constellations each one follows the story in more detail with three more constellations that are outside of the ecliptic so the 12 constellations that are in the ecliptic are in the path of the sun and there are many many things to talk about that like Sagittarius is Jesus Christ falling off the horse representing when he is giving up his life and each one was also assigned 
to each one of the 12 tribes, being the last one the lion, when Jesus Christ is coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, and that was given to the tribe of Judah. So, I recommend you to read the book The Witness of the Stars by Ethelbert W. Bollinger to check more details about that. Would that help us in the first industrial revolution? The fifth, sorry, the fifth. Even when it was the first knowledge, the constellations was one of the most ancient knowledge of humanity given by God, inspired by God. And we may understand why the constellations and the stars in the most ancient names in Hebrew and in Arabic have those names because uh, some of the constellations have a different shape that the Gentiles, the Hittans, distorted with their mythologies. Like, what is doing now a crab in the constellations when the stars had the names of a donkey? The Asinus, Australis and Asinus Borealis represents the mother donkey and her baby donkey where Jesus is going to enter again for the third time when he's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming into the real Jerusalem and the real rebuilt temple that is 600 feet south of the uh, Wailing Wall that is right now the place in reality where the Fort Antonia, where the Romans were staying so the Welling Wall is part of the Roman fortress because it's totally in 100% opposition of the prophecy of Jesus that was fulfilled that the temple of Jerusalem will be destroyed and will not be left rock or stone or brick over brick. And that was fulfilled. So the real temple is 600 feet south of what they call the Welling Wall and the Jews because they don't believe in Jesus and they never accepted his words. They didn't accept his prophecy. And they think that that is part of their temple. But they are praying and worshipping to a hidden and pagan wall that was part of the Roman fortress Antonia. Wow. Well, origin of man and of woman. A female clone is possible to be obtained from a man, not vice versa. And it's another fifth industrial revolution, the cloning. How to obtain a female out of two male cells. That is the explanation of the origin of, of Eve out of Adam. And the most logical way to do it is from taking a pluripotential cell of the bone marrow. For example, of the rib of one of the bone marrow centers of the rib bone. You take two cells of a male. And what you do is you remove, take out of one of the cells the Y chromosome. And you insert from the other cell the other X chromosome. So you end up with two X chromosomes inside a cell obtained by a male, but that if you culture in the proper environment, you will have a female out of that uh, uh, two cells of male fused into one just by removing the Y chromosome of one of them and inserting the X chromosome of the other. That's one of my proposal of research that I am doing. To obtain a female mice out of, of two male uh, pluripotential cells of a male mice. Uh, they just look at me and I think they, they laugh. But it has all the sense and all the meaning that is possible to it. Then the fall of man. Biological eternity was shattered by settling the dead gene in man. So whatever was forbidden and the man ate introduce the dead gene into the sperm of man but the ovule of woman was unaffected so death entered by man and through man but the ovule is uh, eternal so to speak because it can be preserved from one generation to the other and a female baby even when she is inside the, the belly of her mother have already the total number of ovules that she's gonna held all her life that's why they speak scientists like Weizmann from Germany did a very beautiful study of the continuity of the ovule, of the immortal ovule, so to speak, compared with the discontinuity of the sperm of males. 
that stops 100% being produced once the fetus and the embryo, embryo fetus and, and then the baby until the adolescence is when the sperms are starting being produced and there is no limit on the number of the sperms. They are mortal and discontinuous but they have no limit of production. So people like Abraham when he is 100% years he's still able to produce sperm. But the women have a limited number of ovules even if they are a continuous from belly to belly and even the, the fetus of a female have already the full number of ovules that is going to have the whole life and no more than that. So you need to think about that and see the beauty of the Bible explaining that. But only the female reproductive ovule was not affected by the fall of man. That's why the ovule of Mary was okay to be used and God needed to create inside that ovule the perfectly dominant complementary genes that made Jesus Christ an innocent blood, which means for us scientists, the perfect genetics, the prototypical genetic genetics as it was meant to be before of the fall of Adam. So the origin of Neanderthals, as explained by the Bible, were monsters originated by the fallen practices, by the fallen practices of men, such as Neanderthal, and that's why there are many other varieties of organisms that seem to be skulls, that seem to be mixtures between animals and humans. And like mules, big, like mules, but sterile. So they were produced continuously for a temporary time. And then when the production stopped, they got just extinct by mixing them up. Some of them with uh, chimpanzees in the opposite sexes, uh, trading sexes. Sometimes the male was the animal, sometimes the female was the animal. The chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas produce all of these different kinds of uh, supposedly uh, pre-human uh, organisms that are really all of them post-human because first was the real human and after that the product of the degeneracy of those humans. So that's why Cell in 1997 when they did the first sequencing of the mitochondria of Neanderthal found it totally different from humans and they called it Neanderthals were not our ancestors. So when scientists say that we have that we have a percent of Neanderthals, it's all the way around. So the Neanderthal took all the genes from humans and mixed them up with the uh, information of uh, animals. Mm -hmm. They were like the hybrid mules of humanity, and that's why they got extinct when their production stopped. The flood of Noah, extinction of big mammals, and like the Neanderthals were products, were products of degeneracy, genetic degeneracy. The big mammals also were products of the tampering of humans with the genomes of those animals. That's why God did not invite those big huge mammals into the ark, but only the perfect prototypes of what he had created in the fifth and the sixth day of the reordering. No more dinosaurs, but only a new breed of reptiles, of birds, of uh, mammals during the fifth and the sixth day of the reordering of planet Earth. But look, th this rhino is more than five meters long and tremendously tall as well. Three meters tall or more compared with this human that is here. So it seems that the people from the days before of the flood were trying to reproduce G gigant, giant uh, mammals and uh, to see which one was able to come up with the most exotic gigantic mammal. We have here the giant slot with the big ferocious uh, claws and we have here the saber tooth tiger one teeth bigger than the head of the lady that is looking at it. All of those are aberrances, uh, modifications, biological alterations twisted the ways of the Lord, he was saying, the same the Neanderthals. And that's why the Gentile nations that were uh, producing those Neanderthals needed to be also destroyed, because they were not only having commute with evil spirits that were giving them advice, but they were also producing uh, breeds of organisms that were anti-natural and against humanity itself, because they were corrupting the genome, so to speak. 
that was the reason of the flood in the days of Noah. Peter explains inspired that that was like a baptism for the cleansing of the earth for, from all the corruption of the fallen men that were trying to prevent the coming of the Messiah, of the Savior, of Jesus. Because if all the genome were corrupted, there will be no more human 100% genome left. And the only one that kept 100% the human genome was Noah and his family. Because all the others have already genetic insertions to be superhumans, to be X-Men, genetic insertions of other beasts and animals. That's tremendous. They had uh, figured out how to produce those monsters, Neanderthals, and other varieties. Virgin birth of Jesus Christ is all science as well. The dominant genes covered the recessive, and the Y chromosome was also produced by God, or created in the ovule of Mary to be 100% sure that the product will be a man. So God needed to have in his hand the control, not only of all the dominant genes, to produce a perfect man, as Adam was before of his fall, but also to be sure that the product will be a man and not a woman. So God needed to put inside the blend of the perfect chromosomes, the complementary chromosomes in the ovule of Mary, the Y chromosome, to be sure that it will be a perfect male. That's fascinating. So the new creation, with no rotation or translation, the celestial planet is a cube, the dwelling place of God that is outside of this universe and beyond the waters that surround the universe in the direction of the Polaris of the North Star to land in the Middle East in the future. So as God was living with Adam and Eve in the past, in the days of revelation in the new heaven and new earth, God is coming to live again permanently and forever in the new earth that is going to be like the same earth as this one, but totally reconstructed to the point that the shape, geographical shape, is not going to be the same as we know it today. No more oceans are going to be there, but uh, whatever is going to be the identification of the location of Jerusalem and the Middle East, that's where the mother chip, as I used to call it, the planet of God, is going to land and it has a lot of uh, 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 precious stones, 12 precious stones as the foundation, each one representing each one of the 12 apostles, and 12 gates, three in each side, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So it, it's all mathematical, it's all fractal, it's all perfectly this God. And it's going to land the celestial planet, the cubic planet, on the Middle East. But most of that cube is going to be inside the earth as the foundation. So the surface is going to be all in transparent gold, the most precious and perfect gold, in the same way that each of the gates is going to be a card structure made by a gigantic pearl. The pearls, P-E-A-R-L, pearls, gigantic pearls from gigantic uh, mollusks are produced in the waters that surround the universe just below the planet of God. Some of the valuables produced in the dwelling place of God, the most beautiful white horses, the most beautiful and gigantic pearls, they represented here one of the big pearls, but they, they are going to be carved because it says that it's going to be always open. So the, the pearls are going to be like carved to make the, the access door that is going to be always open of the New Jerusalem, that is basically the planet of God staying on earth forever. And inside it, there is people living eternally, eternally, in spiritual uh, bodies that come across the whole universe, each one owning a solar system, so to speak, each one owning his own star, as predictions of the Bible, and inhabiting the whole universe. So when they ask, what is the purpose of the size of the universe if we are the only ones inhabiting planet Earth? Bible prophesizes that in the future, we, the sons and daughters of God, are the ones aimed to have our own solar system and to start populating and inhabiting all of that with our productions of life. It's something fascinating as sons of God. 
also the delicious food that is uh, in heaven one of the meals is the manna from heaven so manna perfectly beautiful feet white horses with perfect genetics gigantic pearls some of the valuables produced in the dwelling place of God all of this is literal real biological so the conclusions um, before concluding uh, Jack Deo Mike Jack Deo asked me did you ever um, talked about how your research can help to stop the pandemic of coronavirus at this time and thinking about that just uh, on Saturday which means just three days ago from today I have never talked about that uh, Mike Jagdeo, thanks to him, he made me think about that and I started doing a critical analysis of the sequence and I found uh, a 12 uh, basis sequence that is a perfect match mostly of bacteria a corroborated perfect match of bacteria mostly and uh, predicted for some other higher organisms eukaryotes because bacteria is prokaryote one of the predicted uh, organisms is an algae the other predicted organism is the dolphin and another organism that holds that sequence is a fish a variety of salmon, the white salmon but the most of the sequences like the 31 uh, sequences are bacteria different kinds of bacteria most of them repeated bacteria with different strains and then the coronavirus so by doing that discovery for one I realized that it was a human hand involved in the design of uh, that virus because uh, a perfect match of bacteria is uh, a sign even if they don't use didn't use the commercial uh, splicing uh, tools the well-known splicing tools in order not to be detected they use unusual not usual but designed by themselves uh, tools and one of them seems to be this uh, 12 bases from bacteria and that's also the Achilles heel the vulnerable point of the COVID-19 because if it's from a bacteria we can by researching those 31 bacteria or one of them to find out what is the restriction enzyme that can cut in that specific position and develop a medicine out of the restriction enzyme specific for the sequence of this virus that was originally from a bacteria and in that way we can destroy break the virus and control in that way the spread all of this using the fifth industrial revolution just by thinking critically what was artificial from what was uh, natural and normal we conclude by saying that the ancient wisdom well before the conclusion I'm gonna show you another article that I actually published where we can really see it was called controversies in science published by DNA and cell biology and I was the first one and the only bold one to detect a 12 base pair uh, artifact artificial sequence contaminating thousands of sequences of the gene bank of course the scientific establishment especially the biotech establishment didn't like my discovery because that would show that the methodologies were totally deficient by leaving fragments of the linker of the methodological cloning, cloning linker they call in science cloning to the like multiplication and reproduction of uh, genes that are concentrated multiplied to make a, a bacteria to produce like a lot of the production of one specific protein and by looking critically to the microarrays I found that the places with the linker had no expression zero expression so I say this is not natural natural and part of the mRNA but it's an artifact a methodological artifact 
So the study of the basically of the sequences of the microarrays as they were represented by software like DChip. I am thankful with the designers of the DChip that are also Asian, Chinese as far as I remember. And uh, that software helped me to identify the artifacts that were not present in the actual sequences but only in the contaminated sequence like this one at the top but the others had a break that is not showing that particular area it's like a void like the void made in the area of the 12 bases of the COVID virus so and what happens with the linker the E. coli linker is like it gets encatenated again like a color and it's so much complementary one side with the other that it pastes itself so when the restriction enzyme is coming to digest this area it cannot find the restriction sites because it's folded and it passes away and leaves the areas that are self annealed or folded preventing them from being digested that's why the linkers escape digestion of the E. coli R1 uh, linker from its uh, digestive enzyme and this I found it I even represented the structures self annealed that were being made that were precisely being prevented from the digestive enzyme to be eaten because basically they were folded and look how beautiful folded structures they used to make according to the complexity of the linkers so by being self annealed again by being self annealed the artifact linkers in the sequences of uh, living organisms they were unable to be digested by the enzymes of restriction that used to eat them and they stayed in the sequence and the scientists thought that they were genuine sequences present in the organism especially some Chinese that was a big controversy controversy that I will not give details but uh, you see here all the sequences that had that linker that artifact and the others that were thinking that was a genuine component of those proteins that are described there so that uh, was a very painful discovery for me but I tried to be honest and again I don't want to give so much details about how much uh, trouble I got into it but by using the same understanding the same reasoning I am finding now when I put the COVID-19 sequence especially the one for the spike protein that uh, for example somebody else discovered that in this particular segment all of these portions correspond to different kinds of uh, genes for the HIV and even some Chinese that have done studies on this they say that the encapsulation behavior of the coronavirus is similar than what that of the HIV so it has also the possibility to escape escape the immune system because of the HIV related uh, sequences that are right here but then we see that uh, the bat virus is the backbone of the COVID-19 coronavirus of 2019-2020 the one that is uh, producing this uh, pandemic and it had as an insertion of a virus that attacks pangolin and the specific six sites that are the key sites for this virus to penetrate into the lungs of humans but not only of humans but of cats so whoever designed that wanted to have a hidden vector to keep on making the disease uh, a long-term situation but then we discovered that and we said hey you better stay away of big and small cats because every kind of cat, the domestic cats and the wild cats are also affected and hosts of this uh, COVID-19 
even if they don't get as sick as humans, because other components of this gene may make it highly, highly, highly infective and contagious in humans. But the sequence that enters into the cells of the lungs is basically a sequence of a virus of a pangolin that was inserted into the backbone of the virus of a bat. So this really looks like somebody tampering with the genes, especially when we have uh, two researchers from Wuhan doing research and publishing a research in 2015 of an analogous virus doing exactly the same that the COVID-19 is doing with humans. They produced a lethal virus for mice that especially was killing the elderly mice, like an eugenic stool to kill the elderly. And that was developed in the Baric Laboratory of the University of North Carolina in 2015. I did a full video as an appendix of this presentation, just being inspired by the question that Michael Jagdeo posed to me. If it weren't for his question, I will never have started to analyze and to question myself the sequence of the COVID that has uh, this fragment of the pangolin to penetrate into the human lungs and have this other fragment that allows it to be camouflaged. Allows it to be camouflaged. This is the 15 bases long sequence that allows this uh, virus to be camouflaged, camouflaged and surrounded by sugars. So it, it can hide completely the amino acids that are behind it, escaping the immune system. And this is the sequence that is mostly found in bacteria and in that uh, white salmon, according to the gene bank. But we need to check also if that's not an artifact, what is present in the white salmon and who did the sequencing of the white salmon. Because I think that is a non-conventional a tool that was used by, by the Chinese of Wuhan because precisely as I say the, the Chinese two members of the research team of uh, Barrick of that publication of 2015 were from Wuhan and they, want, they were the ones that broke the deadly mortal sequence of spike precisely the, the sequence of spike that further modified was able to produce is being able to produce destructions and catastrophes in the human population. And this is the sequence that is uh, from bacteria, as I found in doing a blast comparison, this one that appears in a hollow inner. And it's totally abnormal for the general 30,000 uh, bases of the virus, because it has 80% of GC uh, nucleotides, and that's proper of bacteria that the whole bacteria are bacteria that are GC 75%, like a bias of their organization. So this is basically the most intriguing discovery of a bacterial uh, sequence of a length of uh, even 12 and 15 nucleotides, even if the last ones are also already present in the virus itself but they complement the others from the bacteria to make the uh, split site when they are transformed into amino acids. So that's very interesting. And I will not go in more details because I have done it as an appendix a 45 minutes. That the very same day on Saturday, after talking with Jack Deo, I started reading about that virus and the genome of that virus. And I selected three articles and that's what I presented. The article that exposes this sequence as an unknown sequence but they leave it without an explanation of what is the best match and i just very simply put that sequence 15 basis sequence in blast and immediately it, it gave me the match of the bacteria this is the match that i found and i noticed then the bias of the authors of that article that is called the proximal origin of covid 19. And one of them, the main author, has a big conflict of interests because he's a founder of a biotech company and at the same time he's receiving three grants from the government of the U.S. So that's a big conflict of interests 
And as a biotech guy, his responsibility is trying to hide the problems of all of these contaminants. So he says that the COVID-19 is totally natural. Would we say how the insertion of the pangolin virus got in the key positions to penetrate the lungs of humans in the bat backbone of a virus and how the 12 bases of a bacteria got inserted to camouflage even more against the immune system of the victim, uh, this uh, virus. So I put the, the, that sequence and given its importance, I think that I'm going to read it here. The sequence is C, C, T, C, G, G, C, G, 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 C, A, C, G, T. It seems to be C, G, T. So this translates into proline, arginine, arginine, alanine, arginine. And that's the split side of purine once they are transformed into amino acids, but not before. So when I put that sequence that I just read in BLAST, you can find the actual sequence in the link that I'm going to put of the pertinent papers. This is what I found. These are the matches. And these matches basically are mostly bacteria. So you can do the same exercise. And it will be maybe for some of them, some of you, the first approach in your molecular research. But look the bias of the paper published in March by that guy of the conflicts of interests of the proximal origin of the virus. They leave uh, blank and empty the source, the organism that is the source of those 12 bases. And they don't even give an explanation in the text that the best match are bacteria. Because they know that if it is discovered, it will be found out that it's a human hand the one that designed it, because the logic, according to the first industrial, fifth, fifth industrial uh, revolution in technology and in industry, of course, is to realize that the things that are outliers, the things that don't make logic, the things that don't match, are made artificially and don't follow the harmony of nature that is normally perfectly symmetrical and only with damage get asymmetrical and this ma is making the virus out of the percent of the CG this is the only part that have 80% CG that is C to sign and one in the one that have the triple hydrogen bond is right here so the authors of this paper of the proximal origin of COVID-19 published in March as a letter to one of the nature uh, magazines nature, nature Medicine don't even explain that this matches bacteria but they explain that the real sequence that penetrates the lungs is originated by a virus from the pangolin and the six basic amino acids for the penetration of the virus COVID-19 in the lungs are the L that stands for leucine F that is phenylalanine and that's an hydrophobic amino acid that tends to hide while L is uh, leucine, this is phenylalanine. The Q is, is one of the Im amino acids. And then the S, serine, that is phosphorylatable. Phosphorus activates it. Uh, and then N is another amino acid. So one of them is the glutamine. I think it's the Q. Check that first, please. And the N is the other amino acid that is the uh, asparagin. Check. Maybe they are backwards. But one is glutamine, I think is Q. And the other is asparagin. What is N? That are the aminos derived of the only two acid amino acids. That is uh, glutamic acid and aspartic acid. So glutamine and asparagin. And then the final is the Y of tyrosine. Another uh, phosphorylatable big amino acid. So those ones are not present in bats but in pangolin and that's why the researchers say the sequence from a virus of a pangolin appears inserted they say naturally by nature into the 
bat uh, sequence that integrated the viral the virus of a bat sequence that integrates the most 96% of the of the COVID-19 virus. But then they didn't give an explanation of this uh, polybasic because it's basic arginine, arginine, arginine three times cleavage site of the furin. Okay, this is very intriguing. That shows the human hand and shows that whoever designed it and released it has no interest in providing the antidote. So I am proposing to use a restriction enzyme to destroy this site, site that is bacterial, but to discover which one is the restriction enzyme that corresponds to this segment is going to take time to take the, the bacteria that were found uh, in these uh, groups that I was putting here that you can check just by doing yourself the comparison. And uh, oh well. We conclude by saying that the ancient wisdom as preserved in the oldest manuscripts and stones, especially from the Bible, describe or hint to a very advanced human knowledge in the past, in the times before of the flood of Noah, that now can be retrieved for the benefit of mankind, like the I Ching. So there are more things to say, but I think that uh, is uh, good, is reasonable to stop right here. And whatever question you have, please you have my email in one of my slides. And uh, the best way also is just to post your question in the bottom of this video that I expect to put uh, in YouTube. And if Mike Jagdio likes it, he can edit it and repost it in whichever other platform he likes because this is like my job application and that's uh, the excitement with which I am also presenting this so God speed God heals God protects all the ones that believe in him from these pandemics and that very soon the solution will be found hopefully some of the designers changes his heart and gives the antidote not only a vaccine, but something that is a better and without side effects solution to prevent this pandemic to continue. I love you. I love Jesus Christ. And in the name of him, I say goodbye. I pray for my best job because I want to provide for my companion, my girl companion, and all our plans that we have together to start all over, starting the full career of medicine. Precisely to see all of these things with compassion and knowledge for humanity. So that's one of our dreams to start all over. Even if I have a, post, a double, a dual postdoctoral, that was another question that I was forgetting. Just before the beginning of the pandemics, I was working as postdoctoral in the New York Medical College. And Jack Dio, one of his extra questions was, how did you get to work there? And I say, just by doing a regular job application, I send my curriculum, uh, the researcher of anti-obesity, like at my background, Mr. Dr. Nader G. Abraham, and his uh, uh, administra administrator, research administrator, Gail Anderson, they liked my profile and they invited me to be a postdoctoral. So I was working there before the pandemics. But uh, now I am in an undisclosed location because of my discoveries of what I am finding in this virus, like a product of human genetic engineering. So only God knows what is the next uh, chapter of my life and of all of this. But I am praying to God. And as I said before, stay away of cats as a preventative measure. And well, see your writings and your offers of jobs soon. God bless you. Bye bye. And of course, grants and opportunities of scholarships and whatever for me to study medicine with a woman I love. Those uh, six years and then the specialty. 
only God knows, but that's our dream. And we live out of dreams, so, and excitement. God bless you. Bye-bye.